Aloha, and welcome to Talk Story with John Waihe'e. As usual, we have another interesting guest this afternoon. We have with us Joe Kuhio Lewis. Kuhio is the CEO of, the, uh, organiza of an organization that's committed to Hawaiian advancement, Native Hawaiian advancement. In fact, it's called the Consul on Native Hawaiian Advancement. Welcome, Joe. I mean, Kohio, you've been here before. Yes, thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me back. <laughs> well, you know, I wanted to catch up with you because um, you've been doing quite a few things. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, recently, CNHA had a convention. Mm -hmm. It was called the Native Hawaiian Convention. Yes. And uh, almost every conceivable issue that one could find in the Hawaiian community was discussed or mm -hmm. had uh, played some part mm -hmm. in the, at the convention. Yep. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you what were trying to do and what happened and so, the rest of it. The last time I was on the show was almost a year ago. I, right. had, I had just started in the role as CEO. Yeah, so, so this, this is, is a year, year later. This yeah, one, welcome back. One year in review. Okay, so... Yes, we just had our annual convention. Um, about 1,600 Native Hawaiians were registered and attended. Uh, we covered a, a, a number of different issues from Mauna Kea all the way to community organizing to policy issues that are uh, facing Native Hawaiians. Basically, it was our think tank area to figure out how we want to go forward. Not necessarily depend on the system, but how do we solve problems amongst ourselves, Native Hawaiians, so that we can go forward. That was the premise of the convention. Well, you know, one of the most interesting, um, I, I guess, the discussion that mm -hmm. I, I had the privilege of, of, of being there was this, uh, there's a discussion about economic development mm. and how uh, Hawaiians uh, could be uh, helped in, in, in developing their own, uh, I guess, enterprises. So, or, yep. Or, you know, tell us a little bit about that, because that's kind of unique uh, for your agency in, in the sense that you really work on a, a much broader field. Yeah, if I had to summarize what we do, I, it's more of a facilitator convener role. So we're an intermediary as well. What that means is we bring people to the table, uh, resources to the table, and we find solutions to address a number of problems. So as it relates to economic development, you know, oftentimes networking with one another, identifying challenges and barriers that face businesses uh, can be your actual answer to solving longer, uh, to solving problems. So in this case, bringing Hawaiian businesses together to talk about what barriers they are facing. And overcome. And, over and have so overcome, the, right. Yeah, so the barriers they're facing and identifying solutions collectively to navigate them uh, is very much a part of what I see our role as doing. So convening, facilitating discussions. I don't think I was in that room the whole time, so I don't know all the answers that but came But you out. do. Uh, but, one of the interesting things about it was that you actually uh, seem to either facilitate or make loans to oh, yeah. uh, Hawaiian businesses. So in addition to our role as facilitator, convener, CNHA is also a loan fund. So we, ha we operate a loan fund. We loan money to Native Hawaiian businesses, whether they're uh, incubators or they're micro-enterprise businesses or they're small businesses. We lend them money. Oftentimes, capital is the key to helping them open the door to a bigger market. Of course, we don't just give our money to anybody. We work no, with them to right. make sure. What is the criteria? Well, you've got to be a, a small business owner. You have to have a business plan, and the business plan has to make sense. It has to work. We review all of that. You have to have cash flows that, that make sense and allow you to pay off the loan or pay back the loan. But we also help you. If that's not the case, we work with you to help strengthen and your model. And that's the plus, right? I that's mean, that's what, that's what you add um, on the whole. Uh, yeah, so we offer technical assistance. To our small businesses. So we don't just give them money, we make sure they're successful with our money. How many businesses out there are? We've lent about to 128 business, uh, 128 Native Hawaiian families to support their growth and development. Um, so we have $5 million that's revolving right wow. now. 
Um, so the money gets paid back, it goes to the next Hawaiian in line. And let, let me ask you a controversial question. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hawaiians have, I think, personally, I think gotten a bad rap for uh, making these types of loans and, you know, not paying them back. Now, maybe not just Hawaiians, it's just small business people mm -hmm. in general. Because it's tough out there, let's mm -hmm. face it. What, what's your... Uh... The, key, the key to that uh, is, is oftentimes servicing the loan. You don't just give someone the money. You work with them while they have your money. You check in with them. Sometimes you have to be creative. You have to reconstruct the loan. For example, one of our business owners this month asked if they could defer their payments for a couple months. Sure, no problem. If it means a greater success for your business, then sure. What they needed the money for was to reinvest during the holidays so they had more inventory. So it's about having products that make sense for your business, not just here's your business, here's, here's your payment schedule. If you don't, we're going to Yeah, this is not welfare, in this, other words. The people got to put out and, and, you gotta, and show that they're, you know, they're serious. Sure, about. and you got to have a system that allows them to succeed. It's not just black and white. You got to be flexible. So we have products that we change sometimes to accommodate the, the economy. Um, so it could mean if a business owner is struggling, we suspend their payments for a few months. Whatever the circumstances may be, you as a loan fund have an obligation to support their long-term success. So we are flexible. Most banks are not. Right. And, and so your default rate is... Much less. So you would think it's higher because we deal with higher risk borrowers, but because we service the loans uh, much more frequently than the business, uh, the, the banks, because we follow up I'm with them. much more personally. Evidently. It's much more. We know our borrowers. We know them. We know where they're at. They know where to come to us. We have a relationship. So that's the difference between us and your traditional bank system. And that, to me, has equal to greater success in the way we lend. Well, you know, it's, it's exciting because, and I, I don't, you know, I don't want to make uh, comparisons, but you seem to be... Uh, the the state of Hawaii through its Hawaiian Homes program and also I guess the as the state of Hawaii and the Office of Hawaiian both do loans to individuals but they haven't been having the yeah. success you have. Well, I've been trying to tell them give us the money we'll lend it out you know because at the end of the day they're state agencies we all know state agency what they do best is bureaucracy. Right, they go up and down the pipe, and they still can't figure it out. Right. So, <laughs> but they know they have to go up and down the pipe. And they got all the money, too. So, you know, that, so they are just not set up, in my opinion, to support the situation facing our beneficiaries, our Native Hawaiian community. And, you know, they're, they're, like for OHA, they have resources. They, they match resources with ANA, so they're regulated. So they're not as flexible as our, what we call a CDFI, a Native Community Development Financial Institution. So they don't have the flexibility that we have. They're also a state agency, procurement, all that stuff. It's a process. It goes through their accounting division, which they have you know, rings uh, to go around. Well, so. that's a great idea. I mean, here's something innovative for them, for people who are listening to consider, and that is, why not, in a sense, what you are is the private sector. So why shouldn't mm -hmm. these uh, uh, agencies use uh, Native Hawaiian private sector initiatives to get uh, more economic development? Yeah, well, we're working on it. We're working on some interim things for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, maybe helping them package the loan so that that portion of the work is not have, and doesn't go through uh, them. We package it for them, and then they just review and approve. We're trying to find ways to make it happen. They're not, it's not that they're close to the discussion. It's just it don't move as fast as I want it to move because there's need out there. People need access to money, and things are just not happening fast enough for them. So tell us what else you're doing to improve the economics of, well, uh, for uh, Native Hawaiian families. By the way, who qualifies as your beneficiary? Native Hawaiians. Our, our primary and, audience is Native Hawaiians, so that the no blood quantum requirements as long as you're Native Hawaiian. Um, we can service you. We also service non-Hawaiians as well. Really? When non-Hawaiian comes to our office, we're not going to say no, we're going to assist them. If it's a part of the ohana oftentimes, so a wife, a spouse, non-Hawaiian, of course we're going to help them. Uh, but our kuleana, as we see it, is to uplift the Native Hawaiian community and help them with a hand up, not necessarily a hand well, out. Well, one of the up. big problems, I'm glad you said that, and that's, uh, I wasn't, you know, uh, wasn't on my agenda, but I, I do want to discuss that because one of the most 
traumatizing situations that I've seen occur with the uh, with the uh, Department of Hawaiian Homeland mm -hmm. has been the situation that happens when, as often happens, Native Hawaiian uh, homesteader mm -hmm. marries a non-Hawaiian uh, yep. spouse. I mean, obviously he married, so that has a non-Hawaiian spouse, and then passes away. And the spouse who has put their entire life in making a home and keeping it, and you yeah. know, all of that, all of a sudden is not eligible for any kind of assistance. So, yeah. The, yeah, the Department of Hawaiian Homeland, that is the structure that was passed down and delegated to the state by, by the Fed. Um, however, um, there are some rights that the spouse has. I don't think everyone understands those rights. They have live-in rights. They have, you know, their, their children, of course, would be heir, and the, the mom or the spouse who's non-Hawaiian would have the right to remain in the home. There's some rights that they have. But, yeah, at the end of the day, they also have the right to sell it if they want to. Oh, right, right, so right. So there's, right, there's right. some options that, that they have. Not the best options, I would say, but there are some options available. Are you a homesteader? I am. Terrific. And, yeah. uh, and uh, did, were your parents homesteaders? Or did my you... parents are homesteaders. My grandparents are homesteaders. So it's multi-generational. Of course, we have our own lease now out in Kapolei. Right. Um, I enjoy being a homesteader. It, you know, it's very community-like. You know, everybody knows each other. Okay, well, great. And, and uh, I got to tell you, I'm a homesteader, too. Yeah. So my, my dad was, but we waited forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. to become homesteaders. My, my sister now lives on the homestead. But I, I'm really glad that your agency is focusing on the economic of, mm -hmm. of, of Native Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what are the other areas? Oh, I know yeah. you do a lot of advocacy work. Yeah, so we have a policy shop as well. So we, we focus on Native Hawaiian advocacy. Um, what that involves is essentially looking at systemic change, you know, ways in which we could address policies that are barriers to our success. So advocacy and uh, um, working with our legislature locally, as well as at the federal level, ensuring that Hawaiian, have, Hawaiian voices are represented at both those levels. So our convention is tied into that. At convention, we identify pri priorities. Those priorities are then circulated to our legislative bodies. So they know what the Hawaiian interest is this year. So, that's so do you, uh, and I know that you had legislators attending. Yep. We had almost 30 of them this year at our convention. So that was great. Well, I'll, I'll, there's two issues, and we're going to take a small break now. But when we come back, there are two issues I want to get into. And that is the mixing. The first would be the mixing of economics and advocacy. Because as I understand it, uh, you you were you, had, you were had a substantial involvement in the uh, Aloha poke, uh, Pokey okay. Aloha Pokey uh, controversy <laughs> yeah. a few years yeah. ago, and uh, also then uh, get to you know and then just in general, what are some of the issues oh. that we have for Native Hawaiians? So folks, we'll be right back in one minute with our guests, Kuhil Lewis from the Council of Native Hawaiian Advance. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, from 11 to 11.30. This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off, and so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. Aloha, Stan the Energy Man here. You can see me every Tuesday at 3 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, we're not on Friday anymore, so don't be looking for me on Friday. I'm on Tuesday at 3 here on Think Tech, coming to you live and direct from the beautiful studios in downtown Honolulu's Pioneer Plaza. So please join me, and we'll talk everything about hydrogen and clean energy, not only for Hawaii, but for the whole wide world. Aloha. Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe'e and our guest, Kuhil Lewis, from the Council on Native Hawaiian Advancement. We were just going to have a little fun here. Now, wasn't it, it was a couple of years, or at least a year or so ago, 
I saw you uh, handing out or selling T-shirts, actually, <laughs> uh, saying oh, something yeah, yeah, yeah. about uh, yeah, Aloha right. is not for sale, yeah. you know, and uh, doing community yeah. organizing. And so you were a very important part of the, uh, I guess you would call it the Aloha Poke movement or, or something I like was, that. I got involved. I got very involved. I was new in the role that I have now. Um, but what we saw was cultural appropriation at its finest. You know, we, we saw a mainland chain restaurant copyright Hawaiian language and then send letters to Hawaiian businesses <laughs> saying you can't use Aloha in the same sentence as your okay. Poke. So, you know, I, I was offended by that because who, who gave you the, the rights to our language? Right. So I did. I, I, I got together a hui of us. It was a number of different organizations came together, but I funded some of the advocacy efforts. We flew to Chicago and we staged a big protest right in their downtown area. We, we marched. What, so what's the, what was the end result of that? Well, they stopped sending letters, cease and desist letters. I mean... It was a band-aid approach, and we have, that's one of our priorities, actually, is looking at how we can get into some form of legislation, some kind of protection, because this is not just happening to Native Yeah, Hawaiians. because, you know, by the way, that same organization has just opened up, like, I heard yeah. something like a couple hundred yeah. pokey stores across the yeah. United States saying, Aloha Pokey. You yes. know, and it's the, what's most irritating for me is the thing is not even pokey in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, it's, it's most tossed salad. <laughs> yeah, it's basically tossed salad with uh, pieces of fish yeah, thrown in, yeah. uh, you know. But, okay, so uh, I don't want to kill it, but that was kind of, uh, I know that you folks uh, got some degree well, yeah. of success with that. Because That's a form of advocacy that we do. I mean, you know, we don't always get down and protest and kue, but, you know, in, in that situation, it was necessary. So we stopped them, I would say, to, from sending more cease and desist letters. Um, but it's not the end of the road. We have to take our advocacy to another level. And, uh, you know, okay, that's, uh, uh, boy, we, we're going into these different chains, but another ch chain we, we, we talk with economics again, with economic development again, was that you also provide a lot of training mm -hmm. for Native Hawaiians who want to have, uh, uh, up job, uh, upgrade their job skills. I, I saw something recently where you were developing apprenticeship yep. programs uh, for uh, trades. Yep, so the, the Council for Native, one of the, one of the things when I came into this role, I kind of restructured the organization a bit. And one of the priorities that elevated for me was job readiness, job training, raising income for Hawaiian families. That was the goal, right? Is right. how do we get our Hawaiians so they can live in the homeland? What I'm afraid of is 2020 census, it'll show more Hawaiians on the continent than back home here. And there's Why? a chance that might be well, and correct. It's absolutely a, a, a good chance that that's going to happen. But the only way we can survive in our homeland is if we figure out how to raise, how to our, live here, how to right? raise our income, right? right? So we can pay $9 milk. Anyway, <laughs> one of the ways in which we're doing that is, is through... $9 what? Milk. Really? I paid nine dollars the other day for me. Well, that's more because I was lazy. I never like drive down the road, but I bought it at, at seven eleven. Nine dollars. Nine dollars at seven eleven. Oh, yeah, you're right. So okay, tell, tell me what are the training programs? So we have uh, it's a number of training programs that help our young uh, Native Hawaiian students. Um, I don't say they're all young. Eighteen to forty four is our bracket, but we get them all the certifications that they need so that they can go into a trade. So, for example... Are you working with the unions on yes, this? Yes, we oh, are. Fantastic. So, for carpentry, let's talk about that one. So, carpentry, we'll put them through a 10-week uh, course. It's only two hours a week. So, if you do the math, it's 40-hour investment. They walk away from our program with OSHA certification, with respiratory training, forklift training, all of the basic things that they're going to need so that when they're going in for an interview... They're at the top of the pile because they have the certifications that oh, they need. So they go so into the apprenticeship program. It gives them a hand up. It gives them the basic things that they need to be successful in that career path. So, and it's free. We don't charge them for that. I want to thank Aloha United Way, by the way, because they funded, they seeded that program as well Fantastic. as Oma. Yeah, so it, it, it's you going very teach, well. Uh, I saw uh, one of the advertisements were for policemen. We have a police program as well. So th that program is about 11 weeks long. You go uh, once a week, every evening, you learn about the police academy and all of the elements within the police academy. So when you get in, 
you, you can right be through. an A student. Yeah. And, and we've already seen success. So we graduated 17 from that program. And already, I want to say seven or eight are, have already gotten into the police academy and right. passed their entry test. So, kudos to them. So, yeah. I, and, you know, and, okay, while well, we're talking about all these economics things, you know, there's an elephant in, in the room, obviously. And uh, because we have Native Hawaiians right now uh, on, uh, on Mauna Kea, yep. which is influencing, I'm sure, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of conversations in the Native Hawaiian community. I, I don't want to decide the issue, Monica, mm -hmm. except uh, I did want to ask you, though, how, what effect Monica, the, the, um, the protectors of the, sure. of the Mauna sure. have had on your, uh, on your operation. Sure. Well, it's, I, I would start off by saying you, of all people, would know what comes from activism. Right. Our movement is on the backs of activism. So what we see before us right now is Hawaiians, uh, this is the, our generation of activism, and the question is what is going to come from this for the greater movement of, of our Lahui. And so I, I have, uh, our organization has to a certain degree gotten involved, uh, not deeply, but we've provided a platform for them to have discussions. We have provided resources. So that they can express what it is that they Correct. are doing. Correct. Which is, I get, uh, the first step for communication. Yes. So, to me, what we see coming out of Mauna Kea is a resurgence of Hawaiians identifying who they are and uh, giving themselves a sense of place, a sense of uh, a Hawaiian, and that is amazing. I mean, it's inspiring. And even though, if, no matter where you stand on the issue, when you see them come together and galvanize, you see twenty thousand Hawaiians walking through Waikiki. It sparks a sense of place. In Plus, you. you know, it's, there seems to be some consistency in the messaging, in the sense that the hokulea went around the world. Yes. Malama Onua, yes. which is taking care of the space that you're mm -hmm. on or the planet. And even uh, with Mauna Kea, you're talking about uh, uh, this uh, taking care of Malama, Malama. the it's Aina, all, or the and, Aina. You know, and so the, isn't that a message for more yes. than Native Hawaiians, though? That's a message for a planet. Yeah, and I can tell you that I would consider myself, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm um, kue, kue type of Hawaiian, you know, where you're yeah. always into the into that aspect, but I can tell you that I understand that what they are doing is necessary. It's necessary because Hawaii, it makes you pause, and it makes you think more critically about our, our, our aina. It makes you think about our state of place and whether things go on behind the scenes that shouldn't be going on. It makes you think more critically about about society about and the way it works. About policy choices that have been made. And decision-making processes. So I, I commend our Kia'i. I think they've held it together really well. This concept of kapu aloha is something that we've all learned from as well. Um, so I think there are some amazing gems that have come out of this, this movement already. You know? Well, I tell you, uh, and this is where I wanted to fold everything together in a sense, and that is that I, I heard uh, one of... The young men, and I don't know if he realized uh, how, that somebody like myself would be listening to him talk and mm -hmm. then uh, pick out of his conversation something that I thought was really important. I mean, he didn't necessarily spend a lot of time on it, but what he said, which is, uh, I think, falls into your objectives, is that he said that they are about half or better Native Hawaiians that now live on the mainland. And, then, and I think that if we looked at our total local population, people who were born here, I think more than half probably are on the, uh, not, I shouldn't say mainland, and I apologize for using the word, but on the continent. Because mm -hmm. it's, you know, we're the mainland. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, on the continent, right? So all of these, and, and what he was expressing or trying to express was that when we, perhaps we need a new criteria in our, uh, how we evaluate benefit, 
Like he said, like, you know, we constantly, and this was more clo closer to uh, what he was actually saying, which is, you know, we, uh, we always talk about the benefits that mm -hmm. something would bring us. Uh, so we have the, we construct a new hotel, or mm -hmm. we, we talk about the benefits, the, job. the jobs, and so forth. Yeah. And yet, when we get done, more people have to leave because they can't afford to live here. Yeah. So are we, do we have the right criteria in the 21st yeah. century for islands in the middle of yeah. the Pacific? And I thought, man, that, you know, whatever you think of the program, that's a brilliant concept. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you know, you, somebody will tell you that the 30-meter telescope will bring all these benefits to Hawaii, mm -hmm. but they never put the next question, which is, and it, may, and it may be that it'll benefit, but uh, mm -hmm. they never put the next question in. Yes, we'll accept all those benefits, but will it actually end up with more people being able to sure. stay here or yeah. come back home? Sure. And, and uh, I don't know whether we should be doing well, more of that with our policy decisions. I think you're right. I think he's right. I think you know the reason why we all, beyond Hawaiians, love Hawaii is because of the natural beauty that it, that it provides. I can tell you, I, I, I feel comfortable saying this, is if Hawaiians weren't in the picture right now, this would be a very different Hawaii. You wouldn't Absolutely. have the beaches and the pristine environment. If Hawaiians weren't fighting them every step of the way, Hawaii would be completely different. So I think that causes pause for the whole structure to think about that. The criteria that you're setting, rather than it putting it on a temporary value job, or, or saying that what economics about? are the most important thing, you sure. know, or, or anything. And, and one way of looking at economics, like the young man suggested, was how many people will stay mm -hmm. here. You know, I mean, we look at Kakaako. I don't want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, you know, yeah. we moved yeah. to Kaka. Kakaako. You got all this great economic development, and we all know very few local people, or if any. Are still there? Are going to be living in yeah. Kakaako, and Kakaako at one time was a busy industrial hub mm -hmm. of uh, shops and uh, auto repair shops and all kinds of things. I mean, I you know what was it so beneficial to change that we end up uh, end up with the census sending anybody mm -hmm. away? So I'm hoping uh, your advocacy well, deals with that kind. I think, I think the road ahead is very interesting. The other thing I wanted to just mention as it relates to Mauna Kea is, you know, I was saying it as, as I went down to Waikiki for that march through, and I stood on the side, and I decided to just video as people were passing. And I was amazed at how many Hawaiians were what. And I kept saying to myself, my God, imagine if all of these guys voted. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If all these Hawaiians voted... Like if you think about it, I mean, this is this is a perspective. Hawaii has 1.2 million eligible voters. Of that, 640,000 actually vote. That's half, and the, I mean, that's registered. I should say. Yeah. So of 1.2 million, well, actually, 600, it's, uh, well, it's about 600,000 600, eligible. If because 1.2 million is I think all. I it's 1.6 million is everybody. Yeah. Anyway, my point is, is 640,000 are registered to vote. It might have gone up in the last election. But of that 40, 43, 45% vote, so you're talking about this state being controlled by a little over 200,000 people. Yeah. When we have over a million that are... Uh, and 10% you know, will walk in in Waikiki that day. Yes. So I mean, my point is, is... 20,000 new fresh Hawaiian voters could send lightning rods to the system about the, we can think more critically about Hawaii, about how we value our home and giving. So what is our values for a change? All right. Well, I did want to thank you very much. Unfortunately, yeah. oh we got zeros buzzing at us. <laughs> and so that That's means right. that time's up. But uh, Kohio, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope that you continue the good work that you have, uh, you and your, actually your predecessors have started. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Aloha. Appreciate it.